right, good morning, everyone. My name is Hiba, and I'll be your host for your next presentation, where I will be introducing Mr. Anthony Annelli Jr., who is a pre-health advisor and an adjunct instructor at the University of South Florida. He is also an alumnus of this university as well. On campus, Mr. Annelli Jr. has a central role as he has assisted students involved in student government, new student connections, the Center for Leadership and Civic Engagements, the Center for Student Involvement, Undergraduate Studies, and the USF Chemistry Department. Please welcome Mr. Ianelli Jr. as he speaks regarding extracurricular activities for future medical students. Can you hear and see me okay? Yeah, perfect. So right. I will start screen sharing your presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you can begin whenever you are ready. All right. Well, happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining me today at this uh, very important session. And thank you to for attending this conference and for everyone putting this uh, national pre health conference together. Uh, I think this is a great way um, to spend the time we have at home to you know further learn about different ways to be competitive to be involved and just to really network with a lot of other professionals. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Anthony Ionelli uh, Jr. I'm a pre-health advisor and instructor at the University, in, University of South Florida. So coming to you from Tampa, Florida right now. Uh, today's session, we're going to really go over extracurricular activities, um, but also we're going to talk a little bit about competitiveness and how that's affecting extracurricular activities. So our session today, I'll have maybe about 20 to 30 minutes of a presentation for you. And then I'll be here to answer any questions that you may have uh, after the presentation. Um, so how today is going to look is I'm gonna start going over a little bit about competitiveness. Um, I know that there was a session yesterday about that. And I know you might've seen some of this in some other presentations, but the reason why I'm gonna show that to you today is because it really does have um, an overall effect, not just on your extracurricular activities, but your entire future medical school application. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So the goals of today's session, go over competitiveness, um, show you how that looks for medical school and other professions as well. Um, going over, you know, you're on two tracks. Um, your first track for the current students out there is to get a degree. And then the second track is your pre-health track, your pre-med track. Um, and sometimes those always don't work together. Um, you know, you could graduate in four years, but then maybe you need a little bit more time to be competitive um, because there's a lot that's involved with that. I'm gonna help you, you know, assess your competitiveness currently, provide you any feedback, recommendations to help you increase your competitiveness overall and for any extracurricular activities. Next slide. And then the second half of the presentation will really just solely talk about the extracurricular activities. Um, we'll re review the different types. We'll go over um, what's actually on the application. What are those different types of experiences that medical schools are looking for? Um, go over some ways to obtain these different types of experiences. I know that this is always been a challenge, but even more so now with the current situation. And then I also have a slide um, and a PDF that you know I'm willing to share with everyone after this that goes over some ways that you could stay involved during COVID-19. Um, it is a challenge right now for students to obtain shadowing, clinical volunteering experiences. So it's important that you're still doing something to stay involved during this time. Um, so I'll go over some of those other options for you um, if you're unable to find volunteering and shadowing at this time. Next slide. So the first thing that you want to think about, you do want to think long term. Where are you currently at in this process? Are you just starting off? Um, will you not be applying for another two, three, four years from now? Or maybe you're looking to apply this next cycle, um, summer of 2021. The reason I bring up this uh, slide is because that is your deadline to get experiences in, um, especially if you know you want to get them on the medical school application. You want to have these experiences either completed or at least started 
by that time that you're going to apply. Because when you do submit your medical school applications in the future, um, you can't really add new experiences to the application. You could always update schools if something's different, but with the actual AMCAS for the MD application or AACOMAS for the DO application, once you submit your application, everything's out there. Um, you can't change the experiences. So that's also a reason I bring this up is just for thinking long-term, um, when can you get these experiences in? Also, um, another thing to add is, you know, with the current situation right now, medical schools are understanding if you weren't able to get any, you know, clinical type experiences this past spring, current summer, and fall coming up. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, if you were a college student, you know, you're excused for before that. So any experiences that you were able to get before COVID-19, great include that on the application. But during this time, that is a challenge. So in the later part of this presentation, we'll go over you know, some future ways to get involved. All right, next slide. All right, so our office here at USF in uh, Tampa, every year or two, we'll pull together statistics. Um, each year, the different application portals will come up with statistics for the number of people applying so that's applicants, a uh, number of matriculants, so those that were accepted and started at the medical schools, and then the percentage of that. So as you can see, we have a variety of health professions. I did highlight the medical ones, um, MD for you know, allopathic schools and DO for osteopathic. So I believe this was from 2018, and 41% of people that applied nationally got into medical school for MD, and then 35 for DO. And you could see how the percentages look from the other health pro professions. The reason I show you this is because you have to stand out. Um, no longer are we in the days of just GPA, MCAT. Schools want to see that you're committed. And that's why these extracurricular activities are very important because it's your way of really standing out and showing your commitment to the health profession. There are a lot more people applying than there are a number of seats for medical schools. So anything that you could do in addition to a competitive GPA and MCAT score is only going to help you. Because unfortunately, as you can see from these numbers, more people are not getting in than are getting in. And also students with competitive GPAs and MCATs are not getting in as well. So you wanna be able to make sure you're competitive overall and that your um, extracurriculars are also you know, competitive um, as well with your um, MCAT and your GPA. So I wanted to show you this because this is just what's going on currently. Um, each year, the number of applicants tends to increase and then the matriculant stays about the same unless if new schools are added. So ever since I've been advising, the numbers have always been around that 30 to 40% range for medical school. Um, so also when applying, you wanna just make sure you're applying to multiple schools. The more schools that you can apply to, the better your chance. Um, you know, a lot of medical schools have somewhere between 100 and 200 seats, or maybe a little less or a little more, depending on the school, but they could have thousands of applicants just for that one school. So have your top choice, but then also have about 14 more choices or more, depending on um, how many you can apply to. All right, next slide. So this is just a site. There's many good sites out there to learn about the different health professions. This is one of my favorites, explorehealthcareers.org. Um, so just a good link to check out. Next slide. So program competitiveness, as I mentioned, number of applicants to number of seats. Matriculation, it consists of objective and subjective elements. No one really knows why they were accepted into a health profession. The reason I say that is because of the numbers that I just showed you. I can guarantee you that there are far more competitive applicants than those that were accepted. What I mean by that is there could have been that student that had that high GPA, that high MCAT, um, the good amount of experiences and so on, and then it just didn't work out. So for those people that talk to you and say, oh yeah, I got in because of my 520 MCAT score, that's not always the case because sometimes there are 520 MCAT score students who are not getting in. And that's what makes this process really challenging 
um, when it comes to competitiveness. So we always do recommend to have a backup plan um, just in case. You saw 30, 41% of students applied. So there's 59% of students that applied that didn't get in. Either yes, you could reapply and make your application more competitive or you could look to do something else in the healthcare field. So it's always important to have options. Next slide. So what I was bringing up before is it's important to understand that you are on two tracks. Your first track is obviously getting your bachelor's degree. Your second track is um, you know, matriculating into a medical school or another health professional school. So just because you, you know, complete your degree, that only just guarantees graduation. I know at a lot of universities, it only takes maybe a 2.0 or 2.5 to complete a bachelor's degree, depending on the school and the program you're in. But of course, to get into medical school and other health professions, which I'll show you on another slide, the GPA averages are much higher than that. And then just completing your prerequisites um, does not guarantee matriculation into a medical school. There's so much more involved outside of just completing the prerequisite courses. So I have students meet with me all the time, says, oh, I'll have my courses done by this coming summer and then I'm going to apply. And then I'll always ask, well, how's your shadowing looking? How's your volunteering looking, your other experiences and all of that. So there's just so much more involved. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of students applying to every profession each year. So applying to multiple schools and considering um, all options if it does get to that point. Ideally, you know, we want you to get into your top choice and your top profession, but you always have to think about the what if scenarios. Um, if that wasn't to work out, what else you know, could you do? Next slide, please. So this is the slide I was telling you about that was coming up. Um, in addition to that program competitiveness slide that I was going over before, um, our office each year also looks at the average statistics for GPA and MCAT. This was from a couple years ago, so there might be one that was out more recent, but the numbers won't be too different from what you see here. So you can see the various health professions on the left-hand side. Um, I did highlight the medical school ones and then wanted to also just show you the other health professions that we advise. And then you can see the overall GPA. So the overall GPA is the average uh, that students received that were accepted into medical school. So from a couple years ago, the average GPA acceptance was a 3.72. So that's everything. Science GPA that consists typically of four kinds of courses, um, three really for DO, but four for the MD application, that's biology courses, chemistry, physics, and math. Uh, and I know for, I believe it's the DO applications, they look at just the biology, chemistry, and physics. So they look at your courses there. And why do they look at your science courses? They look at your science courses because that's going to be what you're going to be taking in medical school. That's what the prerequisites are. So it's important for you to have high scientific knowledge when going into uh, medical school in the future. And then as you can see here, the average exam score, the MCAT, the test that a lot of people dread. Um, it is a very challenging test. And this is probably, at least just from my experience when um, working with students, this tends to be one of the more challenging components of building a competitive application. So the MCAT at a 528, you can see for MD schools a couple years ago, the average was a 511. So that's about the um, low to mid uh, 80th percentile. And then for DO schools, it's a 503 average. So a little bit lower. Uh, but this right here is something that we do recommend taking close to a year to prepare for. I understand everyone's different. We all have that friend that studied one month and they got the best MCAT score. It doesn't always work like that. So the more time you can spend on preparing for the MCAT, the better. Um, so that was just um, something I wanted to show you because extracurricular activities has an effect on your GPA, the time you study for the MCAT. And what I mean by that is you have to show some good time management because in addition to those co-curricular activities, course you have to maintain a competitive GPA and a comp competitive MCAT score. So that's why you know we show all of this to you in the beginning because you know it's not just the extracurricular activities. All of this is involved with the extracurricular activities. I've met with students who've done very well academically but have not been able to get as involved. 
But then I've also met students on the other end who have been very involved and their GPA or MCAT might have been affected. So it's important to find that balance and to really plan ahead long term. And then also just the other professions that you see here. All right, next slide. So personal competitiveness, your GPA is very important overall science and then pre-health semesters, which I'll go over in a sec. Um, a highly competitive GPA overall in science for medical school, above a 3.6. You might have noticed on that last slide, the overall and science GPAs were really close to one another. So that's important to uh, you know, maintain. Uh, moderate 3.3 to 3.59, low below a 3.3. So this is if you're using you know, the 4.0 uh, grading scale. Um, if your GPA is lower, there is still more time to, of course, improve your GPA, either through taking more courses or taking post back classes. But if it gets to that point um, where my next slide will kind of show you that, it gets to that point where, you know, it's just not working out. There are other options, as you can see from that last page. We had um, other health professions that GPA averages were a bit lower. Um, so just wanted to go over that. Next slide, please. And this is always something, um, you know, when I'm with people in person going over this, when talking about uh, GPA, uh, we always talk about this example. Let's say that you're currently at 90 credits at a 3.0 and you want to get your GPA to at least a 3.5. What I would then do is I would ask all of you, okay, about how many more credits do you need to be able to get your GPA from a 3.0 to a 3.5 if you're at 90 credits? So then I'll get a whole bunch of answers. I'll get all just 15 more credits, 30, um, to someone might say 45. And then they'll be surprised when the answer to that question is you actually need another 90 more credits at a 4.0 to get your GPA from a 3.0 to a 3.5. I bring that up because of what I was just talking about. If it's getting to that point where you know, your GPA is just not improving, not increasing, Yes, there are post-bac programs out there. Um, you can improve your GPA some more, maybe look at a master's program and then you know, be a little more competitive for medical school. But if it's just not working out for you, as I mentioned, there are other um, health professional options um, that are out there. So just wanted to go over that with you. For those of you starting off, GPA is a lot easier to increase in the beginning. Um, start off strong. For those of you that have a lot of credits and you're in a good place, great thumbs up. And then for those of you that are in this scenario, it's about finishing strong and just finding other ways to really improve um, your academic credentials. Because as I mentioned, if you were to be in this example and you needed to get 90 more credits at a 4.0, it's about three to four more years of classes. It's a lot more time, a lot more money. So you have to really consider all options there. Next slide. And then the last thing before I get into the rest of my presentation, which will all be co-curriculars, is pre-health semesters. Um, a lot of medical schools do look at this. They wanna see that you can handle a good rigor of classes in your undergraduate um, institutions. So what that means is, um, I know it's a little different at every place. Some of you have units or you know, credit hours, maybe it's a full semester, half semester. So this example right here, is if you're taking a you know full semester of classes um, and you have about three to four credits per course. So a pre-health semester consists of a minimum of 14 to 16 credit hours altogether with at least eight to 11 of those 14 to 16 credit hours as math and science courses. So pretty much your prereq courses or your strongly recommended science classes. And then the third part of this is you have to you know, do well Anyone could just say, I'm taking a pre-health semester, but if you're not doing well in the courses, it's not a pre-health semester. Um, medical schools, other health professional schools, do like to see at least two years of pre-health semesters. If, you, if all of you are in a science degree, you're automatically going to get these. Um, but for those of you that are majoring outside of a science, which is more than okay, you'll want to make sure that you're doing this in your schedule. So schools like to see at least two years worth of these. That's four or more pre-health semesters. So as the fall semester is about to start, um, either next week or in the coming weeks for all of you, just make sure to check that your fall semester is a pre-health semester. Next slide. 
All right, so the title of the presentation, extracurricular activities, we're gonna go a little more specific into these now. Once again, I just wanted to show you everything with competitiveness because it all kind of ties in as you need to be competitive overall. Um, so extracurricular activities. So I did put a couple links on here and I, I believe that you know, we'll be able to share this presentation afterwards. Um, I can give you a copy of it if needed. These are just links from USF uh, where I work and just examples of you know, different ways to volunteer to shadow. So the main categories for extracurricular activities or co-curricular activities, however you wanna call them, are clinical volunteering. So it's volunteering in a hospital, a clinic, a hospice, just being in that environment. There's also community volunteering. So any kind of volunteering you do outside of the clinical environment, um, whether that's maybe with um, big brothers, big sisters, maybe volunteering at a church um, or just any community event that's going on in your area. Shadowing, so shadowing, observing a physician or another health prof professional um, or just um, observing or maybe informational interviews um, could all be involved with shadowing. Leadership experiences, that involves um, maybe being a part of an organization and having a position, uh, being a tutor, a mentor, big brothers, big sisters, a um, lot of different ways to gain leadership experiences. Or maybe you're part of student government um, or just orientation leader, resident assistant at your university. So a lot of different ways to show leadership. Research, um, this is something that's becoming um, even more important than maybe 10 years ago. Uh, schools are looking for research. Um, of course, it's very dependent on the medical schools that you're looking at. Some might, uh, some might have a stronger emphasis on that than others, but research, um, ways that you could get involved in that could be with a faculty member at your institution. Um, if your office has a, if your um, school has a research office, that could be another way to see what's out there maybe through clinics and hospitals, they might have some research opportunities as well. Um, awards and honors. So have you ever been recognized for anything with an organization, with a job? Um, are you a part of an honors program, honors society? So that's also another thing that you can put on your application. And then other patient care experiences. So working as a scribe, um, an EMT, CNA, medical assistant, phlebotomist getting more of that uh, hands-on experience. Um, for physician assistant, PA school, that's actually a requirement. Um, but for medical school, even though it might not be a requirement, I'm gonna tell you, I, I really think it is a requirement. I think it's something that will really help you stand out if you can show medical schools that you have an experience like that where you can work directly uh, with patients. And then employment, so any experience that you have, even if it's not clinical, it's still a good experience because there's transferable experiences in everything that we do. So that's why I would say, and I think I have a future slide for this, you know, take some time to jot down everything that you've done so far. And you'll notice that I put a little mark here that says beyond high school. So if you have an experience that was in high school before college and it was only there, you don't want to include that on your medical school application. But if you have an experience in high school that you continued or went back to, that could also be something that um, you do put on a future application. So um, these are the different types of experiences. Common questions that I get a lot here, and I haven't looked at the questions just yet. I know we'll get to that at the end. But common questions I get is, uh, how many hours should I shadow? How many hours should I volunteer? Um, clinically. So you might notice if you've done your research on the medical schools that you're interested in, not many or any will post, oh, we want 100 hours of shadowing or 50 hours of shadowing. You don't see that too often in medical schools. I mean, I haven't looked at every single medical school, but the ones that I have looked at, I haven't seen that. So my answer to that is based off of what I see at my university and students that get in we do notice that students that have at least 100 to 150 hours plus or more of shadowing are the ones that tend to be more competitive. And when we talk about 100 to 150 hours or more of shadowing, 
Um, it's going to be with a variety of physicians. You're going to want to shadow a variety because remember, when you're applying to medical school, you're applying to get into medical school. The specialties not decided until towards the end when you apply for that. So in medical school. So right now it's about getting as many different shadowing experiences as possible. So I would say at least four or more um, different shadowing experiences with uh, different specialties um, for shadowing. So for clinical volunteering, that's also a question I get about how many hours for that. Uh, what we have seen is students that have at least 200 plus um, shadowing hours for clinical volunteering are competitive. Remember, I'm giving you these numbers. Don't just get to the number, get to the number and then go past it because um, you never want to limit yourself. Um, the students that are able to kind of put more hours in extracurriculars are the ones that tend to be a bit more uh, successful. And lastly, on this page, I wanted to go over um, the future application. For AMCAS, the medical school MD application, you can put up to 15 experiences on your application. So health professional schools, I'm um, sorry, the application future health professional schools, they want that to be filled. It's 15 for a reason. It's 15 because they want all 15 to be filled, in my opinion. And I think that would make it, make you even more competitive. Um, yes, quality is important, but in this case, quality and quantity are important. So if you've shadowed four different physicians and you have 15 experiences you can put on the application, that's four experiences already because each shadowing experience is different. Or if you have a big job where you have multiple roles, you can split those roles up and you can then um, have those as separate experiences. So 15, it does seem like a lot, but throughout your time in college, you'll notice that these will start uh, adding up. All right, next slide. Seeing some great questions coming in. We'll uh, definitely get to those really soon. We just have a few more slides left. <clears throat> Direct patient care experiences, PA school. Um, so as I mentioned, that is a requirement for PA school. I know that most, if not all of you are interested in medical school. The reason that I'm just bringing this up is because these are just different examples of ways that you could get um, direct patient care experience through scribing, working as a medical assistant, and everything else that you uh, see here. So this also does look very good for uh, medical schools to have that hands-on experience. So if you've done a lot of volunteering in the clinical setting already, you've done a lot of shadowing, this is that next step uh, to work in a position like this. All right, next slide. All right, so a challenge before COVID and a challenge during COVID, how do I obtain these different types of experiences? Easier said than done. Uh, you have to be very persistent. Um, there's not a lot of experiences that are just given to you. Um, you. You have to really make that effort to reach out um, and to connect with as many people as possible. So I always say, look at your inner circle first. Um, do you have any family, family of family, friends of friends, friends in the health profession? Start there. Uh, that's always a good place to start when trying to find an experience. Is there someone you know that has an experience or know someone that has an experience that can help you out when it comes to shadowing or getting your foot in the door in a hospital or clinic? Look to your own personal doctors or other health professionals. Talk to them and see if they're willing to let you shadow them or if they know of someone that they can connect you with. Don't be afraid to cold call and email. Um, there's a lot of uh, health professionals out there. So as you can see from my fourth bullet point, Google, um, it's your best friend. It's my best friend. And it's how I find pretty much every piece of information, even when I'm just having a fun conversation with a, a friend and they're like, wait, I wonder how old that actor is at Google. So that's another way to find just local professionals in your area. And don't be afraid to cold call and email them. Um, on average, at least with our students here at USF, students will reach out to at least 20 to 40 different health professionals before getting a response. So the more that you can reach out to, the better your chances. Student organization. So if your institution has a pre-med student organization, which I know most do, you can join that and they might have a shadowing program or they might have 
um, other connections within that organization where they can match students with experiences. Attending a summer program. I know, unfortunately, this past summer, a lot of those ended up having to, you know, be postponed or um, become virtual. Those are also a good way to get really good experiences. Um, national, state professional associations could provide some uh, good opportunities. And then just going to the hospital, clinic, hospice website and applying to volunteer. You'll notice that a lot of hospitals and clinics in your areas, once they are looking for more volunteers, they have uh, applications online that you could fill out. And then any other ways. So, you know, this is usually where I'd open it up to have people share and say, you know, what ways have you been involved? How did you get involved in those experiences? So everyone has, you know, their different ways how they've been involved. And I, I would say maybe not all of them are listed here, but I think a high majority of them are listed here with usually how people get involved. But I know there's a lot more ways out there that you could get involved than what I have on here. All right, next slide. Alrighty, so thanks to the help of a national association and a former colleague at a different institution, we were um, sent this PDF. And I know a lot of the um, pre-health advisors were sent this form. So this was sent in the spring once everything really was getting started with COVID and we had to start working from home and students had to start taking classes um, virtually. We received this uh, PDF document with different ways of how to stay involved during COVID-19. So, you know, when you have access to this presentation, you can see the link here, or if you wanted to copy it down and check it out, um, this has a, a good list of different ways to stay involved. So there's um, volunteering virtually, um, shadowing virtual, virtually, as I saw someone put in the Q&A in the chat. Um, Operation Warm, uh, paperairplanes.org, do something.org. Like all of these are links that are in this PDF. What's going to be important to medical schools is they understand the challenges of shadowing and volunteering right now, but that doesn't mean you just don't do anything. You want to be able to show them that, yes, this was a challenge, but here's what I did to overcome that challenge. I was able to volunteer virtually. Um, I was able to be a part of a crisis hotline and help people you know, that are going through a lot over the phone. So there's a lot of different ways that you could stay involved during this time. In addition to that, you could continue to network with local professionals. You can start researching health professional schools um, and really see what the curriculum looks like and, you know, make your top 15 or top 20 or however many um, you're going to apply to. Um, engage in free online learning activities, do some reflection, journaling, do something that not a lot of us do right now. Um, back when I was um, in college in your age, um, a lot more of us read. Um, there's a lot of good, good books out there and, and reading really helps. I, I think the students that I meet with that do well on the MCAT, a lot of them you know, read for pleasure and that helps with those really long pack passages that you'll have on the MCAT. And also just reading in general, there's a lot of good material out there that helps you with this process that all of you are in of building a competitive application. So this uh, link right here, as I mentioned, just has a lot of good ways to uh, stay involved. And there's even more than what's on this list. This is just a good list to get you started. Next slide. <clears throat> and I wanted to just provide some additional notes before my last couple closing slides here. So almost done here, we'll have uh, about 15 minutes for questions. Um, additional notes. So you can put up to 15 experiences, as I mentioned, and three out of those 15 experiences are most meaningful. So think of the co-curricular experiences that you've had that have just had the biggest impact on you, and those would be your top three. And that means you could just write a little bit more in your application about those. And in the application, not only are you going to put the to and from date, the contact information, the name of the experience, you're also going to have that opportunity to describe the experience. So you want to include the following. What did you do in that experience? Um, so simply, what was the, the duties, the job description, whatnot. But then more importantly, what did you learn? Why does that experience matter? So you want to have you know, a sentence or so on that. Any transferable skills to medicine if it is not a medical clinical experience? So teamwork, customer service. Um, cultural competence, um, if you're able to work with 
um, people from any different backgrounds. Double AMC competencies. So if you haven't seen those yet, make sure to look at those. Um, that's a great thing that should be in your Google search right now if you haven't seen this. This goes over all the different competencies that medical schools are looking for in uh, future medical students. So that's a way to, uh, you know, kind of build those in with your uh, descriptions. And then any medical terminology. So if you were shadowing or working, you know, in a health professional field, you want to be able to explain it as if you were the physician. Um, you want to be able to explain that surgery, that procedure. You don't want to describe it how someone like me, who's not a health professional, would describe it. You want to go above and beyond that and really let them know that, yes, you were there and you learned a lot from that experience. Next slide. So something for you to do on your own, you know, evaluate your extracurricular activity that you've done so far, um, write an action plan to help you increase your competitiveness. So, you know, if you have 50 hours of shadowing with two physicians, Let's uh, have that action plan be to shadow in the future with two more physicians for at least 50 more hours. Or if you haven't volunteered yet or have any leadership experience, put that in your action plan. And it's important for you to keep track of all your activities. The best way, in my opinion, to keep track is either through your own personal journaling or on your resume or CV. Um, so just making sure to keep track of that. And if you're shadowing, just make little notes each time that you shadow and what you learned in each experience. I think that'll be really helpful when you get to the application later on. Next. And then as I've been mentioning, um, AMCAS, AACOMAS, those are the centralized applications. So that's where you're going to be putting all of your experiences when you do apply in the future. Um, we have seen, unfortunately, that many good students don't show that as well on their application. So when I, when I was going over a slide or two ago about what to include in your descriptions, make sure to include that because that's really giving the whole picture of your experiences. And then make sure that everything's complete, accurate, and really stands out to the committees to give yourself a better chance in the future of getting admitted into a medical school. So then the applications are viewed, students are selected for an interview, decision to admit, wait list or deny. So that's just a quick summary of the process. Um, get to know your future centralized application service. So that's AMCAS and AACOMAS for medicine. And I have some of the other ones listed for the other health professions as well. All right, next slide. All right, is your goal to apply or to get in? Um, hopefully it is to get in. Anyone could just apply at any time. The schools will not deny your application if you're not competitive. They will say, cha-ching, it's more money. So you want to apply when you have the most competitive application. That means you have a competitive GPA, as we've talked about, talked about quality healthcare experiences, meaningful extracurricular activities like we've gone over. You're ready for the MCAT and you've done well on it. And here's a big one. This is another big challenge for a lot of students um, currently, making the connections with faculty who can write you letters of recommendation. I know right now, one of the top types of emails that I'm receiving from USF students is I cannot get a hold of faculty to write me a letter of recommendation. So that's something that for those of you just starting off, plan in advance for that. Keep in mind that most medical schools are gonna require at least one, if not two science letters of recommendation. So faculty that have taught you in science classes and ones that have taught you in upper level, that's even stronger, upper level science classes. For those of you now that are struggling with getting that, you just wanna to continue to follow up and try to reach out to all of your science instructors that you have had to see about getting a letter. But if you've never made a connection with a science faculty member that has taught you, it's gonna make getting those letters even more challenging. So for those of you that's just starting off and have a little bit of time, do not forget about this. Um, this is going to be a challenge and could stop you from applying if you can't get these letters. Um, strong personal statement. So another really important part of the application, really your uh, interview before the interview. This is where our schools really get to know you and hear your story. So I'd strongly recommend taking some additional time to prepare for that and more. This is something that I would tell every single student, but when I put and more dot, 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 
what's some other ways that you can stand out? What's unique about you and your story compared to everyone else that's applying? That's what the and more means. So generally takes two to three years or longer to build a competitive application. So take as much time as you need. Um, the average age right now for students going into medical school, I believe is 25 or 26, somewhere in that range. So more students now are taking gap years. And if you need to take a gap year to make yourself more competitive, I would strongly recommend it. Next slide. All right. So thank, thank you everyone for watching the presentation. Um, we're going to now get to the questions part of it. Um, so how did you want to do this, uh, Hiba? Okay, hello. So perfect. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was very insightful and I personally got a lot out of it and I'm sure a lot of other people did as well. So I'm going to move on to questions. There have been quite a bit in the Q&A oh, nice. and we'll just dive right into that. Okay. So the first question I see is what medical jobs are open for undergraduates who don't have much knowledge of the medical field? So the ones that I see the most in that situation, um, medical scribe type positions um, tend to not require, you know, too much experience there. And they actually train you as you get hired. Um, CNA programs, there are CNA programs out there that are as little as two weeks that you can go through, become trained, get certified once you pass the test, and then apply for jobs like that. Um, Outside of that, I mean, a lot of these types of positions are going to require some kind of schooling and some might even require experience. So that's why volunteering um, or shadowing at a certain place is beneficial for you because if those experiences do come up, you're already in the hospital or already in that area and they're more than likely going to look at someone within than someone that's not there that doesn't have experience. So those are just a couple of examples, but I would recommend um, you know, looking in your local areas to see like what's available and also just start volunteering if you haven't once you're able to volunteer. That's perfect. Okay, so the next question is, I have not been able to do anything clinical due to COVID. However, I've been able to do community service. Is this good or all right? Yeah, that, that's very good. And that's going to show the schools a lot that you took um, the extra time. You saw a challenge and you found another way to get involved and you're helping out your community. So that's really good. Perfect. The next question I see is, if you are a science major, will your other science courses outside of pre-med classes affect your science GPA? Yes, they will. So anything that's under those categories of biology, chemistry, physics, and then math for MD schools, will have an effect on your science GPA. Um, but also that could be a good thing if you're needing to improve your science GPA some more, you can have those classes to help try to improve that, even though I'm sure they're probably more difficult. Mm -hmm. The next question I see is if someone is unable financially to volunteer in a clinical setting, would working in a clinical setting feel a similar sort of experience? Can you read that one more time? Sorry. Yeah, sure. So um, rather than volunteering in a clinical setting, would working in a clinical setting for money, in, I assume, would that fulfill like the same experience? Yeah, I mean, that, that would be an, another great experience. And of course, with working in the setting, I'm sure you'll be able to get a little more hands-on experience. Uh, so if, yeah, if you have a lot of hours in that, that's okay. The ideal applicant, in my opinion, would have a variety of that. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that that one experience should just replace volunteering as a whole. You should do that one big experience and then sometime down the line, try to find a couple hours a week or a few times a month to volunteer in a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, another question I see is how do you research medical schools? Like when you go onto their websites, what, you, what should you be looking for? Yeah, so the best place to start is if you go to AMCAS, A -M CAS and just go to participating schools, you'll have all the schools in one place. And then when you're looking at an individual school, you'll want to check what their mission, vision, values are, special programs that their school has. And then in addition to that, of course, you want to see what courses are required, what they require for letters of recommendation, and just their admissions requirements as a whole. 
Um, but more importantly, you want to make sure that it's a good fit. Um, I see too many students say, I'm going to apply to that one school because I have a cousin that lives over there. You got to have a better reason beyond that. So that's where you find that through the individual schools. Okay, perfect. Um, next question. Is there a certain way that we keep track of the amount of hours that we spend for shadowing slash clinical volunteering? Or are med schools just supposed to take our word for the amount that we report? Yeah, so they, they actually do run on an honor system. Um, you keep track of those on your own. Uh, but of course, you have to put a contact and you have to describe. So medical schools, they, they could read between the lines if it doesn't sound like you've shadowed or have done that. But yeah, they do run on an honor system. They do make you put a contact there. If you put something like 2,000 hours of shadowing, they'll probably question that. Um, if Say if it was like in a year or something like that. But yeah, um, keep track of it on your own journal. Um, I believe there are some apps out there that you can use to keep track of your uh, pre-med activities. Um, and then, yeah, just your resume or CV could be another way to really keep track of that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then the next question is, will gaining a master's degree after college make you a more competitive medical school applicant? Yeah, I think it will be. It depends on the situation, though, because for each student's situation, it's different. Like if your GPA is really low, um, what might be better would be more of an taking more undergraduate classes at like a post back like second bachelor's degree level. But if your GPA is kind of in that low to moderate or more moderate range, as I showed on that one slide, a master's program could be good, could be that good next step um, to show that you can handle even more advanced classes. And what's good are those master's programs that are out there that provide an assurance of an interview or a spot um, into their medical school program. There are a handful of those types of programs out there. Um, so those could be ones to look at as well in the future. So depending on the situation, but in most cases, I would say, yes, it would be very beneficial. Okay, cool. Um, next question I see is with shadowing and clinical hours, what if students were involved with this, but it was affected during COVID? Are there any substitutes or virtual ways that we can like shadow and do clinical hours? Yeah, so if you do a search, I, I, had, I met with a student yesterday over here, um, and she was telling me, she was sharing a couple of like virtual sites that she went through virtual shadowing sites that she was able to sign up and kind of be put on like a waiting list. And also there was another student that told me about a program actually in New York um, that's allowing students, I can't remember the hospital, I want to say it started with an L, maybe like Lennox or something like that, where um, they were actually looking for students for these virtual opportunities. So just do a search. I mean, look at that document that I sent or that I have in the presentation for some options, but then do a search for virtual shadowing and you'll find some. Um, there are some out there. Yep, Lennox Hill. Yep, that was it. So um, that's um, a good option that I've heard a student that I just met with become a part of. Um, but yeah, just, just look and see what's out there because um, there's not really in-person ones um, out there. So yeah, if you do just virtual shadowing, you'll see virtualshadowing.com and other um, opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I'll get a few more questions in before 11.50. The next one I see is, if I just changed my pre-med track, like to my pre-med track recently, but all my shadowing hours and clinical experiences are towards the end of my college years, will it count against me? Well, you might get that question of, you know, what were you doing those years before? So as long as you were doing something productive, whether it was another kind of extracurricular activity, that would be okay. But schools might question that. So that might mean maybe taking another year to get some more of those experiences so you could show a little more longevity. Mm -hmm. Um. Two more like quick questions. Mm -hmm. One is, do neuroscience classes count towards the science GPA? Yes, um, those those would count um, in most cases. Like I said, I, I know every school is a little different with how they categorize the course. But um, yeah, I would say in most cases, yes. Because I know at, at our institution, they fall under, um, I believe, the biology area. I know some institutions, it goes for uh, chemistry. So yeah, the safe mm -hmm. bet would be yes. Perfect. And then I'll add in one last question. For letters of recommendation, does a science class also include math classes as well? So I think what they're trying to say is, can you ask like a math professor for a letter of recommendation? 
That'll be dependent on each of the schools. I do know on the AMCAS MD application, they do count math as a science, where the DO AACOMAS one, they only count biology, chemistry, and physics, I believe. So that's something you'd have to check with each of the schools. But if it is for MD schools, more than likely, um, that would be okay. The stronger science letters, um, in my opinion, tend to come from the advanced science level courses, like the upper level ones. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I just wanted to say thank you again for taking the time out of your day to present. It means a lot to all of us, and I'm pretty sure everybody got a lot out of this presentation. So thank you. Yeah, and then again. Thank, you. thank you as well, and thank you for everyone um, for participating, watching, and your questions, and the, you know, the nice words. Thank you. Mm -hmm, of course. And for everybody watching, I'll try to get the presentation out to you as well, just so you have access to all the links. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You're welcome. Have a good one. Me too. And for everyone watching, we'll take about a 10 minute break. All right. So yes, as Hiva mentioned, thank you so much, Hiva. And thank you, uh, Anthony, for your outstanding presentation. Now we will take a short break. Um, please stretch, go get a snack. Uh, drink some water and join us at a 